So let me ask you this. What sets Disney apart from something like a local or regional amusement park? What makes it better than a county fair? Well, the difference is pretty obvious. Where at Disney, you're stepping into an expensive and carefully crafted experience, utilizing overt theming elements to transport you to a whole other world. In fact, that was really the point of the original Disneyland, designed almost like an enormous movie set that you could visit with rides and attractions that were themed to add to the effect. Themed attractions weren't really new at the time of Disneyland's opening, but what Walt essentially did was create the world's first theme park, where every element subverted audience expectations of what an amusement park could be. This ranged from the decadence of the theming, to the quality and storytelling of the rides, to the highly manicured presentation and excellent cast service. Yet weirdly, despite trying to distance itself from shoddy, rundown amusement parks, in November of its first year of operation, Walt introduced the Mickey Mouse Club Circus, which started as a parade on Main Street and marched its way back to a tent in Fantasyland. According to an article on Cinema Blend, the circus had acts that were pretty typical for your average circus, and was perhaps a little too real world for a place like Disneyland, where guests were often spit on by llamas, and the clowns often wandered around drunk and half naked. Despite some celebrity appearances from the Mickey Mouse Club, there was nothing remarkable about the circus other than how out of place it felt in a venue like Disneyland. It closed in January of 1956, only after a brief six-week run, but weirdly, Michael Eisner brought back a similar concept that ran in Disneyland's off-season from 1986 through 1988. It too featured a parade with performers and miserable animals, and instead of a circus tent, circus acts now perform throughout the park with lion tamers, a tightrope over Main Street, and even more extreme acts like a space wheel or even a loud, obnoxious globe of death. This just seems ludicrous by today's standards, but I don't think that a circus theme is inherently a bad idea. Disney parks are very focused on American nostalgia, after all, and even a sanitized version of the theme has its place, as Dumbo has shown for decades. Despite not being as interesting as its Disneyland Toontown equivalent, I actually find Magic Kingdom's Storybook Circus to be decently themed, and an appropriate area for its park as well. Still, having live acts and real performers and animals all over Disneyland is just peak insanity. Or at least, I would have said so if I hadn't learned about Disney literally porting this over to, get ready for it, Epcot of all places. Appearing briefly in 1987, the Daredevil Circus Spectacular graced Epcot's future world, putting performers in vaguely sci-fi costumes to reinforce a paper-thin future theme to justify its existence. Guests would marvel at the Circus of the Future, which included riding motorcycles and tightropes over guest pathways, adding a difficult to see future wheel on top of Communicore, and covering the Fountain of Nations with a stage that elephants could be marched up to, labeled as Martian Mastodons to justify their existence. This was absolute, irresponsibly unsafe insanity, and yet it has somehow been forgotten. However, while many shows have come and gone at Walt Disney World, the Daredevil Circus Spectacular opens up a category of forgotten, but bizarre and completely out of place shows here. Did you know that Disney MGM had a Ninja Turtle show among a handful of others that were equally as uncanny and out of place? Did you know that you can help this video out by liking and subscribing? There's a lot of forgotten, weirdly inappropriate shows to discuss through Walt Disney World's history, so let's explore a handful that you probably haven't heard of. In the first decade of existence for Disney MGM Studios, there really was a lot of just throwing stuff at the wall to see what stuck. Now of course, the studio production theme that pervaded the park allowed it to try pretty much whatever it wanted, and the result was a pretty good handful of bizarre shows that you wouldn't conceive of ever finding in a Disney park today. Running from November of 1995 up sometime through 1996, the New York backlot became home to Ace Ventura Pet Detective live in action. The show premiered on the same date as the theatrical sequel, Ace Ventura When Nature Calls, as a promotional tie-in, which does seem a bit strange as it was a Warner Brothers film. 
However, the park existed at a time when the Disney Film Library was considered rather small, and often licensed IP from other studios, which is evident through the Disney MGM name. The show begins with a host coming out on a small stage, pumping up the crowd to meet the famous movie star Ace Ventura, who will be popping out of his shack at any moment to do an interview. After a brief moment of confusion, the crowd is encouraged to call his name, and Ace appears on the roof, then rappelling down to the stage. At this point, the host spends the next few minutes attempting to get Ace to interview about his upcoming film, although of course the character is incredibly comedically distracted. I do think that out of the videos I've watched, the actors who play Ace actually do a pretty decent job of emulating Jim Carrey's physical comedy, so while the show isn't particularly interesting in this moment, at least it's fun to see how well they can adhere to the character. The interview is then interrupted as Ace notices a giant, rare spider on the ledge of the building, and noting the $1,000 reward for its return, the Mission Impossible theme begins to play as Ace swings on a rope over to a wooden structure. He then proceeds to balance his way over the wall, stopping to say hello through his butthole, which isn't something that I ever thought I would write into a script. Reaching the end, he slides down and enters the shack, with the confused host pointing out that he's nowhere near the spider. As the window opens and pigeons come flying, Ace sticks his head out, warning everyone to stay away, implying that he's just blown up the bathroom. He begins climbing up a fire escape from out of the shack's roof, producing a lot of fluff for the show as he stops and makes jokes. On reaching the roof, he ziplines across to the next building and begins to sneak up on the spider. Over the next few minutes, a scene that is intended to be comedic plays out where he attempts to capture it, with it appearing first on his back and then screwing up his pants where he manages to grab it from his crotch. In celebration, he then falls backwards as sound effects indicate that he's falling through the building, which then results in the actor coming out for photos for anyone who wants to stick around. Was it a great show? Not really, although the stunt work was decent and I'm definitely surprised to see a more mature film represented in a Disney park. It would definitely be considered inappropriate by today's standards, although taken into the context that this era also included the alarmingly crude jokes of the Hollywood backlot at California Adventure, as well as attractions like the terrifying alien encounter, perhaps Eisner's Disney was a bit more adult than it's remembered in retrospect. Speaking of terrorizing children, Disney MGM debuted the Goosebumps Horrorland Fright Show, running from October of 1997 through November of 1998, based on the popular Fox show that adapted R.L. Stein's popular series. Also located in the streets of America, the show begins with the iconic theme as nothing happens for a good minute or two. Eventually, the man with the briefcase from the TV show's intro walks around the stage, but then quickly disappears, I think implying that he has released characters from the various novels. At the conclusion of the song, an unknown announcer introduces Amazo the Magician, who pops out from a curtain and pats the show runtime with small magic tricks and corny jokes. He then invites children up to the stage who were selected before the show started, then bringing out a box where he implies that he'll use it to chop off their hands. It's a magic trick, of course, although the premise and execution remind me quite a bit of Universal's horror makeup show, which I wouldn't be surprised to find out was an inspiration for this segment. Next, the curtains open and a mysterious box rolls out, which Amazo demonstrates is used to crush people with spikes. He then invites the children in, has them wave goodbye to the audience, and closing the curtains of the box, pretends to crush them as fake screams are emitted from hidden speakers. Truly great Disney Parks material, I would say. Amazo then opens the curtain, only to be surprised as Slappy jumps out, so if you don't like dummies, <laughs> be warned I guess. After a bit of Slappy berating the magician, he then turns to the audience, threatening to turn them into dummy slaves. Angry that Slappy is taking a spotlight, Amazo grabs a magic wand and tries to banish Slappy, accidentally summoning Curly the skeleton, who introduces himself as the Master of Scaramonies, who is actually portrayed through a pretty neat puppet. Curly then fluffs out the show by again threatening the audience as he laughs maniacally, and introduces Slappy through a series of passive-aggressive insults. Eventually, he summons the mummy of Prince Koru, who emerges out of a sarcophagus on a banner, then teaming up with Slappy to throw the agitated Amazo into a cage. Covering it, Curly performs a magic trick of his own, transforming the magician into the monstrous Cuddles the Hamster. Now ready to terrorize the audience, Curly laughs at his new roster of monsters, 
only to be interrupted by the sound of an ominous bell. Suddenly, the executioner from Terror Tower is revealed, flanked by kids wearing haunted masks. This scares off the other monsters, and the executioner takes off his mask, revealing that he's a Mazo and that the kids are the ones from earlier, then concluding the show. So, I get it. Goosebumps was a pretty popular TV series that still has a lasting impact even today, one that introduced a lot of 90s kids to horror in a way that wasn't graphic. While a seemingly strange fit for Disney MGM, I do think it does at least make a bit more sense than Ace Ventura in terms of family entertainment, although it'll still go down as strange and obscure Disney Parks history. Speaking of which, I wanted to finish off this Disney MGM segment with the Ninja Turtles, which premiering with the 1990 film adaptation from New Line Cinema, existed in the park up through 1995. Showing up in the party wagon, they hung off the sides as the van stopped in the back lot, where they jumped off and awkwardly began grabbing their effects from the vehicle. The theme song from the cartoon then began to play as they ran up on stage. A host then introduces them individually by name, and as the theme continues playing, park guests would be stunned with exciting choreography from the accustomed characters. As spectacular as this was, I'm a bit unsure of if this even qualifies as a show, as it's essentially just a glorified meet and greet with some choreography thrown in. On park maps, it was only labeled as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so it wasn't even considered significant enough to have an actual name. That being said, I do think it is an interesting bit of streetmosphere, and like the other mentions for this park, certainly felt out of place as an obscure and mostly forgotten element of park history. Returning to Epcot, I think that the park definitely has its fair share of strange and bizarre shows, many of which, like Captain EO or Kitchen Cabaret, are generally well known to park enthusiasts who are interested in Disney park history. However, I would like to highlight another strange show, one that premiered sometime in the summer of 1994 and only ran for roughly a year into the summer of 1995. If you watched my video on theme parks and entertainment in the 90s, then you might recall that I've already discussed the magical world of Barbie there, although I only did so in the context of how Epcot as a park really transformed during that decade. Here though, I want to provide a bit more context about the show itself, which of course was intended to appeal to young girls, and probably was produced to bring more parents into the park. In fact, it really did have an interesting promotional campaign, with a VHS available in stores for just a penny, if the purchase included an actual Mattel Barbie. Titled Barbie Birthday Party at Walt Disney World, the 30 minute video followed two young girls who explored World Showcase, intending I think to show families that there were various stations for arts and crafts that would appeal to children, rather than just a lot of dry circle vision films. The video itself also focuses on the behind the scenes of the show, which was located in the theater of the American Pavilion and actually launched with quite the fanfare, as even outside of it, Barbie could be seen waving out of a limo that drove through the park. The show itself was also intended to celebrate 35 years of Barbie, and so as the show begins, a host comes out on stage, asking trivia to the audience meant to educate them on the history of the toy. After this brief segment, he introduces the audience to Barbie's friends who pop up behind the stage props, and as they come out, they launch into dance, singing Barbie's World and revealing Barbie and Ken, who drive out on stage in a Hot Wheels car. Next, Barbie announces that they'll be traveling the world to meet new friends, tying the show loosely to the theme of World Showcase, and after a bit of debate of where to go between her friends, she announces that she has a friend in Australia, which results in Ken producing some sort of boat car that transforms into a plane with surfboard wings. As they arrive, they encounter a koala running from Barbie's friend, Mr. Dundee, which... his name must be a reference to Crocodile Dundee, right? After encouraging him to let the koala go free and live its life, Barbie and friends break out into song and dance, with the number evolving with the return of the koala and becoming a beach party, throwing in hula hoops and bouncing beach balls out into the audience. At its conclusion, Barbie and friends decide to travel to Africa as Ken pulls up the submarine, and arriving, Barbie's friends encounter a cowardly safari guide who is afraid of the jungle. Ken scares him away, although now another lengthy musical segment begins, with Barbie and friends dancing around him as he's attacked and agitated by all variety of African fauna. With the song coming to its conclusion, 
Ken arrives out on stage with a boat, and promising a surprise for Barbie and her friends, he has them blow air through individual tubes, turning the boat into a hot air balloon. After asking Barbie's friends where they want to go next, Ken comes to Barbie, who definitively decides that they'll travel to Paris. On arrival, Barbie meets Pierre, a pompous, failed fashion designer who seems absolutely obsessed with abusing his pet poodle, which is a really strange running joke for the next minute or two. After assuring Pierre that his issue is a lack of confidence, Barbie launches into another song about the Barbie touch, bringing up a little girl as a volunteer to be measured and dressed elegantly on stage. Next, Barbie hosts a fashion show, with various models coming out on stage and showcasing different dresses inspired by various worldly regions and nations. Finally, the cast breaks out into a final song, celebrating cultures and friends that they made from all over the globe. The Magical World of Barbie was roughly a 30 minute show, so I've condensed it down to its most basic elements as best I can, but I do think it was surprisingly good, despite myself not being the target audience. Unlike a lot of theme park shows, the original musical numbers are pretty solid, and the show doesn't have much fluff at all throughout most of its run. So essentially, for being such a strange addition to Epcot, I actually like how Disney attempted to fit it in with the international theme, and was surprisingly entertaining for something that I otherwise would have assumed was just a superficial product push. It's another piece of mostly forgotten Walt Disney World history, yet it's still certainly not the weirdest performance to exist in the park. I don't believe that a single theme park has had more shows come and go than Epcot, and part of the reason for this is because many were small and temporary. For example, the park has an oddly long history of hiring people to play living statues, which, while cool, does seem out of place, especially since many were located in Future World. This area of the park, despite being focused on education, often dressed its performers in campy science fiction costumes to justify their existence. Perhaps one of the strangest was the Christos Alien Show, featuring contortionists dressed in terrifying alien costumes that also have Spider-Man eye slits. They apparently first appeared sometime around 1997 and ended definitively in 2006 with a few costume changes every few years. However, they seem to have been largely forgotten, and if not for an article on Disney Tourist Blog, I probably wouldn't have learned about them. In fact, the article highlights a few other obscure Epcot performances that it labels as eccentric, including the 1994 edition of Sirikli, a group of stilt walkers that portray wandering dream birds that travel the world showcase, and later made appearances at Animal Kingdom. That change was probably for the better, because it really did not seem to have anything to do with World Showcase. Another mention in the article was People of the World, which were essentially small world dolls that came to life to terrorize innocent parkgoers around World Showcase. According to the article, they were actually refitted and first premiered in America on Parade, which was located at the Magic Kingdom to celebrate the American Bicentennial, where they too scarred a generation of park guests. To finish up Epcot, while I may have highlighted how irresponsibly dangerous the circus in the center of Future World was, I do think it's beaten by a show in the lagoon called Skylidoscope, which ran from 1985 and into fall of 1987. The premise of the show has Dreamfinder as a narrator, trying to produce wonderful, imaginative colors throughout the sky. Executed through watercraft, seaplanes, and hang gliders, there's an abstract story of his imagination being attacked by malicious dragons, which were just hovercraft dressed up as dragon heads. It's an odd, strange show, one that utilized pyrotechnics and was notably dangerous for how close hang gliders and seaplanes would get to both park guests and other vehicles. In fact, the show ended because of a fatal plane crash during a rehearsal, which seemed... quite predictable. The premise was interesting, but also irresponsibly dangerous. So hopefully, this video has been a somewhat interesting exploration of weird, out of place, and ultimately, mostly forgotten shows of Walt Disney World, and even then, there were just a few I couldn't even bear to really mention. If you've seen my video on Epcot's Millennium Celebration, that you might recall me mentioning the absolutely awful Tarzan Rocks at Animal Kingdom, and from 1999 through 2001, Disney MGM ran a show called Doug Live, which is just... all kinds of wrong. I can only really describe it as... 
disgusting. Well anyways, if you enjoyed the video, go ahead and give it a like if you haven't already done so. And if you're not yet subscribed and have hit the bell notification yet either, you can do so now to be alerted to new videos as they release.